This presentation is called Introduction to Digital Signal Processing and Vibration Analysis. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a, um, a brief intro on, uh, on Prensia itself. Um, Prensia has uh, a number of different um, core competencies. We, we make software, we have training and education, and we also provide services. Um, today's webinar is going to focus to, um, on one of the software brands, particularly ENCODE. Um, as I am an application engineer uh, for ENCODE, that's what, uh, that's what we'll be discussing. Just to provide a little more context on the software itself, this is our, uh, from the ReliSoft and ENCODE brand, this is our, our software offering. Um, we will be focusing today on the Glyphworks and Vibesys part, since we're going to be talking about test data analysis and, uh, and vibration analysis. If you want any more information about any of these other tools, uh, please contact either myself or Alex afterwards, and we'd be happy to get you some more information. So this is the agenda today. Um, we've already kind of done a brief introduction. What we're going to do then is look at uh, digital signals, specifically answer the question, what are they, and, uh, and why do we need them? This, this presentation is about digital signal processing, so we should have some idea uh, about what they are. Um, once we learn a little bit about what they are, we should also understand where they come from. Okay? It's, it's one thing to, uh, to see them, but it's another thing to actually understand where, where they come from. We'll then define uh, digital signal processing. Um, you'll often see this referred to as DSP, as the initials DSP, so um, you'll, you'll see that throughout the presentation as well. Uh, in fact, in the next bullet point here, we'll see how we can use DSP to solve engineering problems. And then at two different instances throughout the presentation, we'll see um, a couple examples of using some of ENCODE's tools um, to, uh, w to use DSP to solve some of these types of engineering problems. Then we'll have a quick summary and finish up with some questions. Okay, so why, why do we need digital signals? Well, if you're designing a new part, let's take, for instance, this, uh, this bracket, this gray bracket over on the right. If you're designing this, you have to answer uh, a series of questions. First of all, you know, what kind of material you're going to use? How big does it need to be? What does it need to look like? Um, if there are edges, can they be chamfers? Do they need to be the fillets? Can we leave them as sharp edges? Uh, is, is this a weight sensitive area? If, for example, this bracket is on that helicopter, it might be, it might be weight sensitive, so we have to include um, lightning holes or, or gussets to increase stiffness in certain areas. Um, ultimately, what we need to do is answer the question, what sort of design choices do I need to make about, about this part such that it survives the design life in my usage environment? Um, and th this concept of the usage environment is, is very important because you can imagine if this part is, is, um, if this part is gonna sit on my desk all day and do absolutely nothing, the, the usage environment is basically non-existent, so it really doesn't matter what this thing, how strong this is, what it looks like. But if this part's going on, say, somewhere on that helicopter, that usage environment is going to be a lot different than if it were sitting on my desk, or for that matter, if it were sitting somewhere on this boat. Okay, so the usage environment is a very important part of understanding the the loads, the forces, the the strains, all the different um, signals and and external inputs that go into this part. So I need to understand those in order to make intelligent decisions about my design. So that begs the question, how, how do I find that information out? Well, you can go record some data and, uh, and look at it. So this, for example, um, is, a, is a time history perhaps that, that could represent some sort of loading environment uh, on my part. So where does that come from? How do I, how do I acquire that data? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is attach appropriate sensors to some sort of physical prototype of the part. Um, I, I use the term appropriate sensors because it's important to, to understand that um, data acquisition is, is a, a whole different branch of engineering. There are a lot of people that will, will tell you all about sensors and, and sample rates and uh, different types of sensors and that sort of thing. So for the sake of this presentation, we'll assume that somebody um, has intelligently done that. They've picked the right sensor, they've put it in the right location, they've oriented it in the right orientation, and uh, we're going to be recording the data that we actually uh, want to record. 
So once we do that, once we pick a sensor, we put it on the part, we then connect it to some sort of data acquisition box. And again, this is a whole other engineering uh, branch deciding what type of acquisition box to use, how is it going to connect to the um, to the sensors, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is we are able to record some sort of data through this data acquisition box. And what we ultimately end up with then is a record of that sensor data from the usage environment. Again, the, the point is we instrument this part, we put these sensors on the part, we record that data in its usage environment. And you can imagine this red squiggly line here that I see uh, as a result um, of recording my usage environment will be a lot different if this were measured on the helicopter versus versus the boat in that picture that we were looking at. I mean, it can make a big difference even depending on where in the helicopter it's mounted, for example. So it's important to understand how that part is actually going to be used. Okay, so let's say we've we've done that, we've recorded the signal, we've taken it off the data acquisition box, and we've plotted that that signal. Um, what kind of information can we learn from that? Well, with just visual inspection alone, we can find some qualitative information. For example, um, I've clearly recorded something for about 60 seconds, a little over a minute, as you can see. Um, obviously, I've recorded some sort of force. So this is some sort of force that's being put through my uh, through my part, or at least this is force that's going through the uh, the sensor that I've um, that I've attached to my part. It looks like whatever I did, I kind of started the acquisition. It's more or less sat idle for about 10 seconds, and then I actually did something. So you can see it starts to get um, a little squiggly and then it looks like there's a couple of large displacements here and then it basically sits idle again after that for another 10-15 seconds or so and then it appears that I do about the, roughly the same thing again so just from a qualitative perspective it looks like I did something I sat idle for a little bit I did something I sat idle again and then I did probably what looks like that same thing again so I've so I've done that twice so that's fine but what else can I learn from this well by just visual inspection, I can learn some limited quantitative information, such as the max. Okay, if I'm just plotting this data, I can see the max is about 1,025 pounds, and it occurs sometime after 50 seconds. Okay, that's great. I can also find the min. It looks like my minimum load is somewhere around minus uh, 1,630 pounds, and it occurs uh, sometime around the, the max as well, roughly a second or so after uh, after 50 seconds. Um, but that's that's really about it. What happens if I want to know what the mean value is? So what's the average value um, or the average load I see on this part throughout the entire time history? Or what about something more complicated like the RMS or the standard deviation? Okay, from from visual inspection alone, I'm not able to uh, to infer or to to grab this information from uh, from this plot. So that begs the question, what is DSP? What is digital signal processing? Well, it turns out that this signal I'm looking at here, this red squiggly line, is really just a whole bunch of discrete points throughout time. Okay, And this is what the data acquisition box does. The data acquisition box records whatever my sensor is outputting at equal increments throughout time. Okay, So you can see over time I've recorded load, and this appears to be some sort of right front shock load. Uh, that I've in, in pounds and in units of pounds that I'm starting to record uh, through time. Okay, and obviously I've recorded this for over 60 seconds, and this little snippet here is just showing up to 0 0.03 seconds. Okay, so this indicates that I have a relatively high sample rate. I have a lot of samples taken per second. Um, so that is the essence of a digital signal. Um, Digital signal processing is nothing more than the manipulation and transformation of this data through computational processing. Okay, so I've got the raw data. It's made up of just a bunch of points through time. I do some thing, some sort of transformation or computational processing in the computer, and I end up with these results. For example, I could calculate the mean, the standard deviation, the RMS, etc. Now, to a lot of different companies, this process right here and going from this raw data to these results could mean uh, a lot of different things. Uh, sometimes this, this little arrow here, this magic black box is uh, a complex Excel spreadsheet that someone created. I know I have these raw values, I just copy and paste them into Excel sheet and, uh, and it gives me these results. Sometimes 
it's um, it's you know a guy who sits in the corner of your office that uh, still uses VI and Linux in a, in a CRT monitor, and you hand him a bunch of data, and he returns a report with a bunch of results. Um, other times, people outsource their DSP needs. Um, they will just give a bunch of files to a, to an external company, and they will come back with a report. So, a lot of different ways to uh, to do this, but it's all essentially the same thing. We're we're transforming these raw values into some sort of actionable information, some sort of results. So what kind of things uh, can I do with DSP? Now I, I know where the data comes from. I know uh, what DSP is, how I, how I manipulate that data. So now that I understand that, what kind of things can I do with that? Well, from a very just basic kind of high level um, uh, perspective, you can do very simple things like calculate statistics. We saw a moment ago that I was able to calculate um, the mean, the standard deviation, uh, the max, the min, uh, all that sort of stuff. I can also calculate more advanced statistics, okay? Things like here I'm looking at things like crest factor and kurtosis and range and skewness. And these might mean something to somebody who's interested in, uh, in looking at the overall statistics of a signal, okay? I can also extract sections of interest. This is uh, particularly useful if I have, as you can see in this signal here, if we assume that, let's say this top signal is my speed, um, I've obviously done something uh, where I've attached my, my sensor and turned on my acquisition box and I really didn't do anything for some amount of time. Um, and let's say I really only care about calculating these statistics when my vehicle is actually moving. Okay, you can use DSP tools and techniques to intelligently select sections of time when my vehicle is actually moving. So now, if I want to calculate something like this box of statistics up here, only when my data, only when my vehicle is moving, I can I can employ these sorts of DSP techniques first to have just a signal when my vehicle is moving, throw away the dead time, and then have a, uh, a statistical table of just when my data is moving. Okay, we can do the exact opposite of that as well. The, the point is that we can extract um, sections of interest or parts that, uh, that I care about from my original signal. Uh, let's see, what else can we do? We can uh, convert accelerations to displacements. This is useful if you're trying to infer some sort of uh, larger displacement and we only have accelerations. Let's say we didn't put a displacement gauge on our part, we only have accelerometers. Uh, we can easily use DSP techniques to uh, to infer what kind of displacements we see. Uh, another thing that's commonly used in the DSP world is uh, anomaly uh, detection and fixing. In this case, we want to, as you can see, we've got some sort of channel here that has these uh, these sort of spurious spikes, and uh, this is not. In this case, it's not physically realizable data, which means if I want to do some sort of analysis on this, I, I don't want these, uh, these spikes in there because it will give me results that are, that are inaccurate, that are physically unrealizable. If this is, let's say, um, I don't know, some sort of latitude channel or a speed channel or something like that, if I'm cruising along here and all of a sudden I see uh, you know, a difference in orders of magnitude, that most likely isn't realistic, okay? So I can use DSP tools to automatically detect and fix those sorts of anomalies, and uh, then I'm left with a simple, um, smooth signal that I would expect something that the physics of my environment, the physics of my part, would actually be able to, uh, to do. And so the point of all of this is that we're using these tools to extract actionable insight from these raw data measurements. We're, we're taking this raw data and we're, we're learning something from it, we're extracting information from it. We're, do, we're, we're uh, transforming these signals into something that, that I actually care about, something that I actually um, can, can make informative decisions from. Okay, cool. So that's great. Um, now, how do, I, how do I do this then? Um, if I have this, this raw signal here, like we saw earlier, I know that the mean is just the average of all of these parts. It's the sum of every single data point in here divided by the number of data points. That's all this equation is showing, right? That's, that's easy enough to do, um, but what if I have something a little more complicated, standard deviation perhaps, uh, also a very well-published equation, well-established, it's, everyone kind of understands what it is, but how do, I, how do I calculate this value? How do I plug this data into this equation here so that I can get these values? 
Same with RMS. I have to choose some, pseudo, some sort of tool um, to, to do that with. Okay, so what tool do I choose? Well, I can use Excel. Um, that's fine, I can copy and paste this raw data into an Excel sheet, type in those equations. Everyone knows that there's a built-in equation for mean, standard deviation, and RMS in Excel. That's fine. Um, however, it can get unwieldy pretty quickly. If I have, say, 50 or 100 channels, does that mean I have 100 different spreadsheets in there? Am I gonna have 100 different columns? Copying, pasting all of those columns and those calculations into different sheets can be um, can get pretty unwieldy pretty quickly. It's prone to typos, and uh, that much data would uh, would make for a pretty large uh, Excel file. So then sharing that among colleagues can be uh, can be quite difficult. All right. So what if we take a slightly more sophisticated approach? We could use MATLAB. Um, these days, any engineering undergraduate probably has some sort of exposure to MATLAB. The difficulty with MATLAB is that there's there's no user interface, so I have to sit there and, and type code, which is prone to syntax errors and, and fat fingering as well. Um, and I, I need some sort of programming abilities. Um, and you know, different different people have different uh, programming abilities. Some are better than others, but the average mechanical engineer probably doesn't have um, professional development experience. Okay, what about Python? Python's another choice. It's a hot language these days, everyone's talking about it. Um, the difficulty with Python is that it's hard to manage and update installations, especially among uh, a large group of, uh, of engineers. It's also hard to distribute because all I have is a text file that contains code. Um, people have different Python installations. You might not have the right libraries. It's, it's a difficult thing to manage across a large group of people. Um, taking that to sort of a, the, the logical conclusion, I can use some sort of custom development, some other language. Um, in this case, for example, C++. Um, it's quite an esoteric language. You really need a professional programmer to be able to do that, to deal with the memory management and the, the user interface. And then you're making all sorts of high-level decisions that um, are kind of well beyond the scope of, of just trying to understand um, what you're trying to do with this data, right? It, it adds a whole other la layer of basically a, a, an entire new job on top of just analyzing this data that requires some sort of programming or development. Um, so it becomes, uh, it becomes difficult to, uh, to manage that on top of trying to analyze the data that you're trying to analyze. So um, ENCODE has a tool called uh, Glyphworks, and uh, Glyphworks is a uh, program with an intuitive graphical interface for standardized analysis of measured data. Uh, what this means is that it's a drag and drop interface. So as you can see from the snapshot right here, we have created a, a process. It's, it's basically a visual programming language, if you can think of it that way. Here we have a bunch of input data. Okay, We've brought onto our workspace these engineering functions here, and it's doing all the calculations for us. All we have to do is tell the software where the data is coming from, where it's going to, where the results are coming from, and where those results are going to. So it's a very easy way to kind of build up these complex processes as opposed to coding everything from scratch. Okay, Glyphworks contains a uh, wide range of built-in DSP tools and vibration analysis tools. So all these little functions here, um, we've got say 100 different glyphs or, or of these little functions here that you can put together and build this complex process that, or you can build a complex digital signal processing uh, process rather easily. Another thing that I didn't mention on the previous slide is that if you have a bunch of data acquisition um, so, uh, hardware that records all these files, chances are those files are gonna be binary file types, which means that it's obscure, it's not, it's not ASCII, uh, data. So accessing that from something like Python or MATLAB becomes uh, an entirely different challenge because then I have to understand how to, to write code to read binary files. Glyphworks uh, supports over 40 different binary file types. It's made to work with data acquisition, um, with files that come off of data acquisition boxes. So chances are if you have a well-known acquisition hardware, um, we can read that file. Glyphworks can read that file natively. The other uh, beautiful thing about Glyphworks is that you can easily save and distribute these processes. So if I 
work on something, build up this really nice process, let's say it looks like this, I can simply save the bones of this process, send it to someone else, they can drop in different files, and, uh, and they can run it and get their results in, um, in no time at all. So it's a, it's a quick and easy way to develop these processes and distribute them to, uh, to colleagues. So what we're going to do now is a quick demo to just show you how you could build um, a digital signal processing flow. In, uh, in Glyphworks, we're going to look at two examples. One, uh, this kind of follows along with the, uh, the use case I set up earlier. We're going to look at how we can automatically remove dead time from the signal, uh, and then we're going to calculate some basic statistics uh, from that. We're going to do that before we remove the dead time and after we remove that dead time as well. So I'm going to shift over into the software now. Let me do that. And let me make sure I'm sharing my application. Okay. So you should be able to see um, Glyphworks now. On the far left, now I started the software before I before I started sharing it. So when I first opened it up, it asked me what file or what folder do I want to point to. This is a folder that's going to contain all the data that I want to process or some of the data that I want to process. Okay, so when I did that, I pointed to a folder that contained some, some raw data files. Glyphworks is able to recognize those files and organize them by type. Um, so you can see I've got some time series data in here. This contains, um, say, a dozen or so files that I've pointed to in my working folder. So this is data that I have available for processing. Uh, these are files that, that after I've recorded data from some sort of acquisition box, I've taken them off the box and put them onto my computer, and now I'm pointing to a file that contains those, uh, those files. Okay, so this is data that I have available to process. Over on the far right, this is my, uh, my suite of, in this case, I'm looking at my DSP tools. Uh, Glyphworks has, like I said earlier, over 100 different built-in uh, tools. Now, each of these little boxes here, we, it, you can think of it as an engineering function. We call it a glyph. A glyph is just a representation for some larger thing, a, a larger engineering function. So that's what each of these individual boxes are, are different glyphs or different engineering functions. Um, so I have input data, I have ways to process that data. In the middle here, this blank white space here is called my workspace, and this is where my process will come together. So <clears throat> the way that Glyphworks works, I mentioned that it's a drag and drop interface. If I want to process some sort of data here, I can simply just drag and drop data onto the um, workspace. Okay, so this was, for example, run one. This is some run I did on some sort of uh, some sort of event. I can see that I have, if I click on the little arrow next to this, I can see I have about 21 channels worth of data. So these are 21 different sensors that have been set up on my acquisition box when I did this uh, this test. I've recorded all of this information. I have speeds. I have um, a brake sensor. It tells me when my brakes on and off. I've got a bunch of micro strain data. So these are strain gauges. I've got some force gauges, some more strain gauges, and then more force gauges and more strain gauges. So this is all this information that I've recorded over time. Okay, I've brought that entire file onto the workspace, so I can click the display button now, and uh, if I want to maximize that, I can do that. So now I'm actually viewing this raw data. This is what we did uh, very early on to just uh, visually inspect that data. <clears throat> uh, as you can see, I've got a speed channel. I've got um, um, some some brake logic, some strains, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so now if I want to uh, do some actual processing with that data, I can simply take data, sorry, I can take some, uh, some anything I want to process over here and drag that onto the workspace as well. So let's say I want to calculate some basic statistics on this. So I can go to my statistics glyph, just drag and drop it onto the workspace, and then if I want to view the results of this, I can go to my display collection and uh, just drag on a something that will allow me to view the results of that. Okay, so I have my input data. I have some sort of process that's going to calculate statistics, and I have some display that I'm going to use to view those results. All I need to do now is tell Glyphworks how these different modules here, how these different glyphs are connected together. You'll notice there are these little colored pads on either side of glyphs. I can simply click on one, and as soon as I do, um, it attaches a little pipe 
to my mouse so I can move my mouse around. You see I've got this pipe attached to it. Now, all I have to do is tell GlyphWorks where I want this data to go. Any pad on the right side of a glyph is an output. So right now I'm telling this glyph here where I want this data to go. So I want it to go to the input of my statistics calculation. And then I'm going to take the results of this statistics calculation and send it to a, uh, a display. Okay. Now I'm calculating a bunch of statistics here. Uh, if I want to determine what statistics I want to use, GlyphWorks, all glyphs in, in the software here have a series of properties. And if I just right click on a glyph, I can go to properties and it'll then allow me to view what statistics I want to calculate. I'm just going to uh, select a few like uh, max, min, median, min, mode, um, I don't know, let's choose another one, RMS, or sorry, range. So these are just a selection of stats that I want to calculate, uh, and that's all I have to do. I say OK. Now my process is built. It's piped up. I have the data flowing where I want it to flow. Now all I have to do is run the process. That is done with this little run button right up at the top here. So I can click run, and there we go. Now I have the results. You can see it's, uh, it's a large table of all of those results that I've requested. Okay, so I've reduced all of these channels, and you can see I've got a table here of 21 different channels of that input data that um, have been crunched and uh, reduced to just these statistics. Okay, now I mentioned earlier, what if I want to just look at these statistics on the, the part of time when my car is actually moving, where my vehicle is actually moving? As you can see, I've got quite a bit of dead time here. I've got 10 seconds here and another um, you know, dozen or so seconds here in the middle. So my statistics are being skewed by this dead time. If I want to remove that dead time, I can simply select some other glyphs and insert them onto my workspace to perform that uh, signal processing as well. So in that case, I want to use a glyph. In this case, it's called the time series calculator. So I'm just going to bring that onto the workspace. And uh, that in conjunction with, uh, with another glyph, I will be able to remove my unwanted uh, data from, from, this, um, from the signal. So now I can take the original data. So this is all of the data again, and I can fork my process. I can say I want my input data not only to go to this statistics glyph here, but I also want it to go to this new time series calculator glyph here. I'm going to take the results of this, send it to my graphical editor, and then let's let's view the results of that as well. So I'm going to attach an XY display up to this. Okay, so you can see I'm very quickly building a rather complex process with just dragging and dropping. I'm not doing any coding. I'm not doing anything complicated at all. This is just drag and drop, building block, sort of Lego type um, digital signal processing. Now, <clears throat> let's set the properties of this time series calculator here. What I want to do is select um, moments in time when my vehicle isn't moving. Okay, so I've got all of my channels here. You can see this is the equation uh, editor. All I have to do is pick a channel and determine when I want to delete data. In this case, I want to know when my speed, so I just click on the speed channel and then enter in a simple equation. When my speed is less than, I don't know, let's say three miles an hour. Okay, I'm going to add that equation to the list, and that's it. Now I'm going to say OK. So let's just run this and, uh, and see what happens really quickly. OK, so now I have a time series calculator here that is calculating or highlighting for me sections in time when my speed is less than 3 miles an hour. And that's what these green boxes here indicate. It indicates this, this dead time, this threshold that I've set. Anytime the speed is below my threshold, it's going to highlight these sections. And then this graphical editor is simply going to throw them away. Okay, and what I'm left with then is just the time when my vehicle is moving uh, greater than three miles an hour. Okay, so now let's say this is what I want to calculate this, the statistics off of. Right now, this table is looking at data when, uh, when my vehicle is stopped and moving. So what I want to do is just reconfigure this process a little bit. So I'm going to disconnect this pipe here and say, instead of taking, instead of calculating the statistics off of this data here, let's take it after it's been, after the dead time has been removed. So I'm simply going to take this data and then send it to my statistics glyph here. Okay, so now I can run the process. 
and you can see the statistics changed, which is good because now I'm looking at a different signal. I'm looking at a signal that's been modified such that my dead time has been removed. So now if I look at this in a little more detail, if I scroll back up to the top, I should see here that, let's see if I can zoom in, my, my uh, speed channel, now it has a minimum of three, which is good because I've removed my dead time. So now my minimum should be three and all the remaining statistics that have been calculated are now on this moving channel. Okay, so it's a really easy way. Glyphworks provides a very simple way to take input data, manipulate it in certain ways with just drag and drop uh, piping interface and, uh, and view the results of those. Okay, really easy to create these, um, these processes. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back into the presentation now. Swap those settings. Okay, so that was Glyphworks. Very simple use case, but um, you can see how, uh, how quickly we could build a rather robust and complicated process with a very few simple steps. If you think of how long something like that would have taken in Excel or MATLAB, um, you know, you can really appreciate the amount of processing that, that went on and, and how easy it was to, um, to calculate something like that. Okay, so we said that this is a presentation about um, uh, digital signal processing and vibration analysis. So where does vibration analysis come into play? Well, vibration analysis is nothing more than the application of some of these DSP techniques and principles to signals in order to learn about dynamic characteristics. Okay, so uh, previously I was looking at speed and I was editing speed and stuff like that. But if I'm interested in learning about the vibration characteristic of a part, okay, I'm just going to apply these principles in a slightly different way. One of the most common applications of vibration analysis is to ask, um, or I guess is to assess natural, natural modes or natural frequencies of, of particular parts. So let's say that I have a, uh, the same bracket that I had earlier. From Dynamics 101, we know that all structures have natural frequencies. Okay? That is, at some input frequency, if I have excitation input at a specific frequency, if that frequency coincides with a natural frequency of my part, it will start to resonate in that defined mode shape. Okay, the reason that's, that could be a problem is because if I have a bunch of external excitation input into my part at its natural frequency, I can see that, you know, if, if this is attached to my, to my helicopter and this part starts swaying around like that, it could cause all sorts of problems. I could have uh, displacement issues. Whatever this thing is attached to could start shaking all over the place. It could cause um, it could cause noise issues and vibration issues. It could cause fatigue issues as well. If I have a part that is vibrating um, with these large deflections, these large deflections are going to um, cause large stresses, and those large stresses are going to cause large fatigue cycles, which means a shorter life. So, having a part resonate at its natural frequency due to some sort of external excitation can cause all sorts of problems. So from a, from a digital signal processing perspective, what we're interested in is learning whether or not external excitation can cause resonance in my part. So if I stick this, if I stick some sort of accelerometer um, on, on my part and I measure the input excitation into it, what I want to know is, will that excitation, will this usage environment, if I use this part in this environment, is there a chance that it can cause excitation at a natural frequency that will start to cause these displacements? Um, so from looking at this signal itself, there's really no way to tell that, right? I'm looking in the time domain. I can see that there's a bunch of kind of accelerations that go back and forth. It looks like it's kind of vibrating all over the place, but I really have no way to know from this plot alone, if there's anything at 25 hertz frequency. Is there any excitation at 25 hertz? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Looking at this alone, I have no way of, of knowing that. So another common application, another common um, tool that we use in vibration analysis is something called the Fourier transform. And what the Fourier transform allows you to do is view these these results here, this acceleration or this excitation in a different domain. So instead of looking at the at time on the x-axis, a Fourier transform allows you to look at frequency on the x-axis. And the way that it does that is through something called uh, the Fourier transform. What Fourier, what 
what Fourier said is that all signals, no matter how complex, so we saw that really complex time signal that I had a minute ago, we'll call that x of t. So that time signal, that function, sorry, that, that signal as a function of time is nothing more than a whole bunch of really simple sine waves added together. Okay, sine waves that have a frequency, a um, phase, and an amplitude. Okay, so if I'm looking at this, this little example right here, this dark, this boldened uh, signal right here, let's say this is my, my uh, signal as a function of time. You can see it's kind of squiggly. There's, um, there's, some, um, there's some different frequencies involved in that. All Fourier says is that this signal, as complex as it can be, is really just a bunch of really simple sine waves added together. So I've got here a sine wave with a pretty high amplitude and a low frequency, okay, added together with a, uh, another simple sine wave that has a slightly higher frequency, so there are more peaks in this, uh, at a lower amplitude, and so on and so forth. So if I were to look at a really kind of contrived example here, this is my, for example, a signal that has some sort of, um, some sort of, you can see it, it kind of has this acceleration profile. So I've got um, a signal that kind of has this large sort of sweeping motion like this. We call this a carrier frequency. So it has a high amplitude, low frequency. I can see this is occurring about every second. I'm kind of seeing this repeating pattern in my, in my signal here. On top of that, you can see that I have another signal that is, is happening more frequently. It's repeating more frequently in my data, and, uh, but it has a lower amplitude. So what the Fourier transform allows me to do is look at this time series data in the frequency domain. So this signal corresponds to this uh, frequency domain characteristics. Um, and as you can see, you know, since this signal is pretty simple, I can visually inspect and see that, yep, I've got something that's around one hertz in here. And if I look at the, uh, the Fourier transform of that, I can see that, yes, indeed, there is right at one hertz here, there is kind of this high amplitude energy. Um, and then I've got some other, you know, lower amplitude energy at about three hertz, and again at five hertz and nine hertz. So this signal corroborates that. I can see that I've got this low, this high energy, low frequency wave, and then on top of that, I got something at about three hertz. So you can see where that kind of overlays on top of this, and then five hertz, which is even more frequent than nine hertz, which is kind of these little itty bitty peaks that you see kind of, uh, kind of in here. So this signal added together, um, or this signal decomposed into its frequency components, will show me what kind of energy is present at different frequencies. So that brings me back to my original signal. What external frequencies are present in this external signal? Well, I can simply do a Fourier transform of that and see this same data represented in the frequency domain. What I can see now here is that I have a, um, uh, some sort of, of profile okay, that's showing me this frequency content as a function of frequency. So the, the question then arises, if I have a part that has a natural frequency at 25 hertz, does my external excitation have energy at that frequency? And I can see from this PSD that yes, indeed, there is quite a bit of energy here present in my external signal right around 25 hertz. Okay, so if my first mode or if I have a, a natural frequency in my part at 25 hertz, this could be trouble, okay? Um, okay, so another common use case of vibration analysis is to remove uh, frequencies above, below, or within a certain range. Um, let's say that I am particularly interested in filtering out frequencies above 60 hertz. Let's say I need to do some sort of analysis, and I know that I only care about frequencies under 60 hertz. Everything above 60 hertz for this application is going to be considered uh, noise and due to some some sort of um, source that that I don't that I don't care about. I only want to analyze my data um, that is uh, that is made up of less than 60 hertz in frequency. So I can use uh, filtering uh, to filter out that data. Okay. So as you can see, if I perform uh, a filter on my input data and say filter out everything above 60 hertz, in the time domain that would look pretty much the same. In fact, you wouldn't really be able to tell a difference in the time domain because that signal will still look like just a bunch of red squiggly lines. Okay. However, if I use the Fourier transform of that, 
I can then visually see that, yes, in fact, this data consists of only uh, frequency content less than 60 hertz. Okay, so that's another advantage of switching back and forth between these domains, the time domain and the frequency domain, because I can see visually very easily what frequency content is present in my signal. So filtering is used for a lot of different things. Uh, filtering out noise or interference is a common one. Uh, that's the kind of the use case I built up right here. Um, you can isolate or remove excitation from known ranges. Let's say I have um, some something in my in my engine that vibrates at a known frequency, and I want to analyze the content of that uh, just the, the the time series data at specifically that frequency. I can use what's called a band pass filter, which means I want to pass just specific ranges of frequency. Um, that's that's a very easy thing to do and a common thing to do as well. Um, the other thing filtering can be used for is, is preventing aliasing when downsampling. Okay, we saw earlier that all signals are just a bunch of discrete points through time. If for whatever reason I need to change the sample rate of that um, and say downsample it, uh, you could be prone to to aliasing your data um, if you do something like that. So using filtering to prevent that is uh, is another common use case. Um, some other things, some other more advanced uh, use cases for vibration analysis are for performing things like waterfall analysis or order tracking. Uh, this is looking at vibra uh, vibration on specifically on rotating machinery. Okay, you can see now this plot here. I'm looking at not only vibration as a function of frequency, but also as of speed. Okay, so this is asking the question or, or helping you answer the question: How does my frequency content not vary not just with frequency, but also with rotation speed. So this is particularly useful if you've got vibration that's tied to some sort of, um, uh, to an engine, a rotating engine, something that has a shaft, a, a jet engine or a car engine or um, some sort of gear uh, meshing or something like that. Okay, waterfall analysis can help you do that. Uh, we also have uh, frequency response analysis. This helps you calculate transfer functions between input excitation and response. This allows you to characterize the uh, structural response of uh, some part. Okay, so I can understand what my what my um, uh, natural frequencies are, what the frequencies are. I can calculate things like um, like damping, and I can I can use experimental modal analysis as well to calculate natural frequencies and also damping. The damping is determined by kind of how peaky these uh, these points are here. Um, and I can look at the, the mode shapes of a structure experimentally as well. Okay, we also have uh, something called operational deflection shapes, uh, and this allows you to animate displacement patterns over a virtual representation of your part. So if I've gone and measured excitations or measured responses at various parts, for example, this is a helicopter frame, if I have say, um, displacements measured at each of these little points here, each of these little vertices in this virtual model here, I can use this, uh, we call ODS, this operational deflection shapes, to see how this part vibrates over time. Okay, and this can provide all sorts of interesting information. Um, you can see here that, you know, uh, how this thing deflects over time. And this, this can provide uh, useful information for somebody who's designing the part, someone who's looking at how it's used in the operational environment, um, to try and infer or, or learn more uh, more information about um, about a part. Okay, so let's jump back into the software real quick and do one more uh, quick demo. This time we're going to look at uh, calculating the frequency content of acceleration data. We're going to look at using a filter to remove some sort of unwanted frequency content. And then we're going to do just some really simple basic waterfall analysis. So not only looking at how frequency content changes, so, uh, sorry, how um, frequency content changes um, with frequency, but also with, with RPM. Okay, so that's called waterfall analysis. So we're going to look really briefly at two, uh, two examples. So let me switch back over into the, the software again. And um, I'm going to... I'm going to create a new process here. Actually, I'm going to leave this up just in case there are questions about it. So let's start a new a new process. Okay, so now I want to look at calculating the frequency content of some acceleration data. So I also have some acceleration data over here. Uh, I've got about six or so channels of accelerometer data. 
just like before, I can just drag and drop this onto the workspace. And again, I can display that, maximize that. And these are fully interactive displays here. So I can zoom in on certain parts of the data. I can overlay the plots if I wanted to overlay the plots. Okay, I can separate them again. Um, a lot of different ways to interact. And you can even learn just a lot uh, about your channels and about your data by just visually inspecting them. Okay, so having this interactive uh, zoom capability and and uh, uh, and everything just within the display is very helpful in itself. Um, okay, so what frequency content is present in uh, in this data here? Now, as you can see over here, I've got six channels. I'm only looking at four, so let's let's look at six as well. They're all here. It just lets you choose how many you want to look at. So I want to look at all six of these at the same time. Okay, let's calculate the frequency content of this data. So I've got my input data over in my signal processing palette and my basic DSP uh, collection of tools here. I have something called the frequency spectrum glyph. This is what's going to allow me to view the frequency content of that data. So I just drag and drop that onto the workspace. And uh, just like before, I can simply grab a, an XY display, drop that on there as well. Um, now I'm going to connect this together. So I take my input data, send it to my frequency spectrum glyph. And now you'll notice the pads are different colors on this glyph. Okay, in in GlyphWorks, that the colors represent uh, data types. So you can very clearly see that we're leaving the time domain. So blue means time domain data, and red means frequency domain data. Okay, so so it's it's easy to vi to visualize uh, this even without um, even without having to go into to too much detail. Even on the workspace itself, we can very clearly see that we're leaving the time domain, going into the frequency domain. OK, so let's just run this. I've connected everything up. And uh, and that's it. Very simple. Let's maximize this. And again, I'm only looking at four, so let's view all of them. Um, another thing that you, if you didn't already realize, I have six channels in here. All six of those channels are being analyzed independently in my uh, frequency spectrum glyph here. Okay, so multi-channel in, multi-channel out. Here's all my results. Okay, so now I get a good idea of what kind of frequency content is present in these signals. Okay, and you know you can change the the axis as well. So if I wanted to view this on a log axis, I could simply do that. And again, on here, I can also zoom in. I can recenter the y-axis or rescale the y-axis, uh, etc. So a lot of ways to visually inspect this uh, uh, this data. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do something else real quick. Um, let's say, just like in the example I showed during the presentation, let's say I want to remove all of this frequency content, this this high energy frequency content. Okay, this this everything above 60 hertz. Let's say I just want to I just want to get rid of it. I don't want it in my original in my uh, in my time series data because the statistics or whatever it is that I want to analyze in my data. I don't want the 60 hertz data, anything above 60 hertz, um, kind of muddling my analysis up. So to remove that, I can go to my signal processing palette. I can pick a filter. So let's pick um, a Fourier filter, drag and drop it onto the workspace. And uh, again, just simply connect that up to here. I go into my properties of my Fourier filter and simply set the, the cutoff frequency. So if I want to pass, if I want to do a low pass filter, I want to pass everything below 60 hertz. That means everything above 60 hertz is going to be thrown away. Okay, that's all I have to do. I just set that up, and uh, now I can view the results of this by looking at the XY display. And let's run this. Okay, now as we saw previously, the time domain doesn't give us a lot of information about the frequency content present in the signal, and this is quite obvious here. Okay, this is my input data. This is my results without 60 hertz data. Everything above 60 hertz is removed, but it pretty much looks the same. It's very difficult for me to tell that I've removed any sort of data from, from here at all. Okay, so what we can do to, to visually see that is, uh, is look at this data in the time domain. So I can simply copy and paste my frequency domain uh, glyph or my frequency spectrum calculator and calculate the results of my filtered data through this glyph as well. So let's do that. So I'm just going to take the filtered data, send it to this glyph. Now I'm going to be looking at the original data and the filtered data through a uh, frequency spectrum glyph. And let's uh, compare those results. 
So now if I just run this. Okay, so now I can very clearly see that red here is my original data, okay, and the blue is my modified data. So I have thrown away everything above the 60 hertz, okay? So what that means is that this time series data here contains just everything below 60 hertz, and this here is just an easy way to, to verify that. Okay, and this contains, like, I'm comparing these two different tests together. So I'm seeing channel 9 from the unfiltered and channel 29 from the filtered. I can use these blue arrows here to, to sort through all of those. So now I'm looking at channel 30, 31, 32, 33, et cetera, et cetera. So I can look through all of that data and see that, um, that it's all there. Okay, so again, really easy way to build up these complex processes and, uh, and uh, see what uh, what those results are without doing any programming, without doing any sort of um, um, complex uh, analysis. Okay, all this analysis is built into these glyphs. I just connect them together, bring in my input data, and run it. <clears throat> um, before before we finish here, I want to show that um, how easy it is to uh, to save these processes. So if I just go ahead and really quickly uh, do a save. It asked me what I want to say this as, so let's call this, um, let's say this is my uh, frequency analysis tool, okay? So I've saved this process. Now I can go send this file to somebody else. If they have different input data, they could simply open it, and, uh, and uh, what they will get, let's just do that. If I want to open my frequency analysis process, now I have the bones of the process that I just created. So if I sent this to my colleague, they could then just easily drop in their own data and run it and see the results for their data. So it's very easy to, uh, to replicate this analysis, to pass it on to your peers and, uh, and do things like that. Okay, so that's Glyphworks vibration analysis in a nutshell. Let me switch back here and we'll, uh, we'll finish up real quick and then ask, uh, have some time for some questions. Okay, so in summary, digital signal processing is the manipulation and transformation of data uh, through some sort of computational processing techniques. Uh, when that sort of processing is applied to um, uh, assess the dynamic characteristics of a part, we refer to that as vibration analysis. Um, and the point of all of this is to extract information from the raw data. We're, we're building a better picture, a bigger picture. We're learning from this raw data, this data that on its, uh, at the surface doesn't provide too much information. We're using these tools and these processes to extract information, to extract actionable insights, to learn something about it, to predict something about it, to, to gain insight from, uh, from this raw data. And finally, we saw that Glyphworks, uh, that ENCO Glyphworks has a large suite of built-in DSP and vibration analysis tools that can be easily used in this uh, drag and drop and intuitive interface. Okay, and we have, um, like I said, over 100 built-in glyphs that um, are available for, uh, for use, just like you saw me use a frequency spectrum tool. You can use uh, other tools in, uh, in nearly uh, the exact same way.